Hi folks, I'm Tom Affolter and this is going to be our second lecture in the CIS 126 or Introduction to SQL class. The first lecture you should have already covered talks a little bit about the databases that we're going to be dealing with, the baseball database, contributions, the weather database, as well as your own personal database that I've already set up for you. So within this section we're going to start talking about the most basic component that we're going to deal with when it comes to SQL and that's going to be the select statement. So, ANSI SQL has a few commands that are going to allow us to view, to delete, to insert, or to update data, to manage that data. So we need all aspects of that. There's a couple of different ways we can do that. We can either do that with Management Studio, or we can do that with a program that we write that we submit the commands into our program. The focus of this class is going to be the raw SQL statements. In later classes, you're going to talk about how you would implement that SQL into an existing program. Now, as far as development goes, my perspective of this is that you are developers using SQL. So I'm going to come from the perspective of making you the best SQL users. At the same time, it's going to be hard not to introduce to you a little bit of the management side of it. So, and occasionally I might get a little bit ahead of my, my slides here, so bear with me just a little bit. Before you can ever use a database, you need to fully understand the structure of your tables. And again, that's what we already did. We went back in, we looked at those different baseball databases, as t uh, baseball and weather and contributions. And as time goes on, we're going to even get to know those tables a little bit better. Now, mind you, as I said before, you don't have to be a baseball expert in order to manage a baseball database any more than you have to be an accountant to manage an accounting type database. You just have to know how to get the data at hand or the data that's being requested. So the better you understand that structure as I talked before, the better you're going to understand how to create these select statements. So I'm going to give you some techniques that I use as time goes on. And again, as I said before, the reason you want to take the class from me is the fact that I'm a database developer. I've got a lot of background in database development commercially, not just out of a book. And I think I'm going to bring to you some of those tricks and tips that I've picked up as time goes on. So it says here, among the most powerful employees of any company, as far as knowledge of power goes, is the DBA, uh, the database administrator, a database um, manager, and the de software developers. And why is that? It's because those people have all the data at hand. All the data at hand. You're like that person with the crystal ball. Somebody wants to know something. They come to you and ask you for that information. And your job is to provide the statement that they need to extract the information. So before we talked, or we should have talked previously, about what's called the DNA reference model, and in that DNA reference model, I talked a little bit about the responsibilities of a complete software application. You have presentation side, that's the user interface. Um, you have business logic, and that's where really the guts of the program and the processing occurs. And in the vast majority of programs, you have a data tier. And that data tier is where the data is being managed. Not all programs have a data tier, but any program that you're going to deal with today, all the way up from, you know, from Google, which is database driven, all the way to Amazon, to eBay, any e-commerce website, um, or any lookup type website, informational website, a blog, they all have some kind of data component behind them. Now, by definition, each one of those data tiers should be independent of one another. So for example, uh, let's take a website. Uh, the presentation side of a website would be the HTML that's being written, maybe some of the JavaScript being written that the user interacts with, the form itself. But when you hit that submit button, that information on the form is passed to the next layer, which is the business logic layer. Now, in a good development environment, those layers are independent of itself, which means that in the old days, if I wrote a COBOL program and one of the aspects of COBOL sucked, I was stuck with COBOL, the good and the bad. But nowadays, as a new technology comes out, I can replace those existing technologies with a newer, better technology. In this case, um, I might have written a website in um, old HTML and have been dealing with, eight, with ASP 3.0, which is an old Microsoft technology. Does that mean then when the .NET technology came out I had to scrap everything? No. What I ended up doing is replacing that middle tier 
and I still can continue to communicate with the same HTMLs I did before, the same JavaScript, and perhaps even the same database. But that's what makes this replaceable. Or looking at the right example here where the data tier is. That data tier doesn't matter. I, I could write a program using Visual Studio today and either use SQL Server or use Oracle or use MySQL or maybe even use that little local database that's built in. But at any point in time, I know that I don't have to scrap those first two layers if I wanted to go, for example, from um, maybe that compact database that comes with with Visual Studio all the way up to SQL Server. There's actually tools to upsize my data without having to replace my entire program. So that's basically what the DNA reference model talks about. The business layer, again, as we're talking about here, it doesn't care that the presentation side was HTML. All it knows is something just passed data to it and it's going to do its job. And it's either going to pass the data back or it's going to go back out and request data from the database. doesn't care what the database is. Again, that's that object-oriented modeling that we're dealing with. So here's an example on this slide of a website type technology using the technology that I would most use. So although XHTML is outdated now, good example of this technology here, because the slide is outdated, is that I could go back in now, change that XHTML to HTML5, modify that left tier without having any interaction perhaps with the ASP.NET, although I must say that there are some things now that HTML5 has added that might I might choose to use with that center business layer, but we'll talk about that later. For now, let's take a look at that communication that happens between that business tier, that middle tier, and the right tier, the SQL Server tier. And you'll notice inside there that we have this little arrow, this black ADO.NET error, uh, excuse me, arrow that points down. What that indicates is that when ASP.NET talks to SQL Server, it doesn't know it's talking to SQL Server, but there's going to be a little piece of software inside there that's going to be managed for us by Visual Studio that tells it when you submit a, a command from your ASP.NET, here's how you talk to SQL Server. And that's an ADO.NET tool that we'll talk about later. And by the way, that SQL Server that we see on the right side is re referred to as our data source or our data provider. Who is providing the data to our application? In this case, it's going to be, at least on this slide, SQL Server. So when we configure an application, we create later what's called a connection string. And that connection string says, here is the type of server you're going to be talking to. Here is your login. Here's your password. Here is basically how this server expects to get its data. And that little ADO.NET black component that we see right here, this feature, is what does the translation on our behalf. And the great thing about that is, is all we have to do is point to those tools and it does it for us. If I was going to change, for example, from SQL Server and wanted to go to Oracle, all I would have to do is modify that connection right here, that ADO.NET connection that exists and tell it, now you're going to talk to Oracle, and I don't have to change very much within my application. So it says, again, when ASP.NET receives data, it, it, it always is in a table format. So we're going to find out that anytime data is going to be transmitted back and forth, um, as far as we are concerned, it's going to be always in a table format. That table could have multiple rows and columns, or it could be a single column, uh, a single cell that's returned back. But either way, it's always going to be shaped in a rectangle or in a, in a table. And it doesn't matter where that data is coming from. It has to be in that format, which right now is not a big deal. But later, we'll have, uh, it, it'll have an impact on us. So let's talk about how we extract data a little bit. And we're going to be spending an enormous amount of time on the select statement. In fact, about 90-95% 90, 90, of this course is going to be focused on the select statement. And why is that? Well, most of the reason is, is that the databases that we're going to be using are already created. Uh, so we're not going to have to go back in and create databases, although I will show you how to create a table and a great, uh, create a database later, um, because you may end up having to do that. You will have to go back in and do inserts, um, excuse me, updates and deletes and inserts of data, I should say. 
And we'll learn those commands a little bit later, but in the Microsoft world, if you know what the select statement is, Visual Studio later will find out, will actually generate the insert updates uh, and deletes for us. But we're not going to go there right now. Let's take a look at the basic select statement. The select statement by itself is basically a statement that just says, give me the output of. So if I said select six, as you see here, that says give me the output of six, that's all it's going to do is give me the output of six. Down below it says, give me the output of five times four. I've got Visual, uh, excuse me, I've got SQL Server Management Studio open. Let's jump over there and take a look at it. Got a lot of stuff open here. Okay, so uh, first thing I want to do is let's, we've got to pick a specific table or database that we're going to deal with right now. So the first thing we need to do is select a database. This is going to be an important uh, process for you to go through and understand. There's several different ways that we can select the database uh, that we want to work with. The first way we can do it is to go ahead and with databases here, open up all the databases, find the one that we want. So in this particular case, if I wanted baseball, I could select baseball and then click on new query. So the work that we're going to do is going to be over here on the right hand side. So I could select new query and it will open me up a new query and it selects my baseball 2015. That's one way to do it. I'm going to close that out. Okay, another way to do it would be to open up a new query and that new query then, it just happened to select the one I was at before. With the new query window open up, you can change databases by coming to this window over here and jumping down below. So if I wanted to go to the weather, I could then jump down to weather. There it is. And now you'll notice that the weather database is selected. Any work I do over here will be on the weather database. So again, first way to do it would be to select a database and then do a new query, it will open that database up. The other way to do it would be to open up a query window, just any query window, and just use this drop down to tell it which database you want to work in. The last way to do it, the last way, and, and probably the less likely way to do it until later when we write scripts, would be the programmatic way to do it. And what I can do programmatically is I can say something like use baseball 2015. Okay, and notice IntelliSense pops open, and it hasn't done anything yet. This is the parse command here. All the parse command does is says, look at my command here. Is my command the right structure? Doesn't tell you whether or not Baseball 2015 exists. It just says, is this in the right structure? Have you organized your statement correctly? So I'm going to hit that parse command, and it says yes. Now. Now if I hit the execute, it's going to run this statement and watch what happens on the top left hand corner. Notice how it changed to baseball 2015. As soon as I do that, I can get out of it. I don't care which method you use to get into your particular database that we're working on. I find that probably the more common way to do it would be to go back in, select, let me close this out, and it, it knows I typed something in. And before I go on, folks, this is not saving my select statement to my SQL Server. This is actually just going to save the work I did here to a text file on my local computer. No different than if I had a text file open and I hit save on a text file, it saves it local. So don't get confused between us. Don't think that because you save this, you can come back to it later and open it up on a different computer because it's only going to save it unless you save it into your Dropbox or into your W drive. It's only going to save it locally as far as you're concerned. So I'm going to go ahead and tell I don't want to save and it closes it out. So now I'm going to come back into my baseball database here, right there, do a new query and I'm in baseball. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you the simple aspect of the select statement where it just says give me output. So I can type select and, it, and by the way case doesn't matter in SQL. Either for rows or columns it doesn't matter. So I can have typed select in this way, or I could type in select this way, or I could type in lowercase select. It makes absolutely no difference. But if I say select six here, and before I go on, most instances of ANSI SQL, and you will see this in examples, require a semicolon at the end of the complete statement like C-sharp does. 
The fact is, is Microsoft does not require you to put the semicolon, so whether you do or you don't, it's not a big deal. You'll see that in some of my examples I do, and some of my examples I don't. So right here, if I do select 6 and I hit execute, notice down below here it comes back and gives me 6. If I did select 6 times, and the asterisk is the times, 6, and I hit execute, it comes back and gives me 36. So basically what I'm showing you is the select statement just says, show me output. Um, I could put text in here as a matter of fact. I could say, and one thing we'll find out is that just like when we're dealing with strings in programming languages, strings within SQL have to be enclosed within either quotations or apostrophes. Now, you'll find that the vast majority of SQL developers will use single apostrophes. And I ex I'll explain later why that is instead of double apostrophes. So f you'll see that in my examples, for the most case, it's going to be a single apostrophe. In the old days, uh, Management Studio would not allow you to put double quotation marks in, but it will let you do that now. Um, I'm not going to take points off if you put double quotation marks in, but I am going to point out later that that will cause a problem for us as a programmer when we have quotations in it. So let's go back here. If I put in here, my name is Tom, inside of apostrophes, and I execute that, that's exactly what it's going to come back in and tell me at the bottom, my name is Tom. So I can do numbers here. I can do math. Let's do 6 divided by 3. That's the division symbol. Execute it. Notice I get back the 2. So the standard select statement just basically says, is, give, give me output. Okay. Let's continue on. So uh, this is another slide that gives you some examples here. Notice I got seven, select 7 to times 6, as we did before. I've got 7 times 6.0. Now, I want to I point this out because we're going to have a problem here. And this screen, and this is going to be something that's going to go on through the entire quarter as well as all of SQL. And let's take a look at what's happening here. When I do 7 times 6, I get a 42. When I do 7 times 6.0, I get a 42.0. But watch this. When I do 6 divided by 7, let's take a look at what's going to happen with 6 divided by 7. OK, so let's jump back to SQL. And if I do, you saw if I did 6 divided by 3, it comes out with 2. But if I do 6 divided by 7 and I execute it, I get a 0. Now, why is it that I get a 0? The reason is, is the answer that's going to be returned in a SQL statement is always going to be based on the data types that go into it. Or, I, let me reword that. Your answer will always be as precise as the most precise aspect of the formula you put in. So in this case, I've got integer divided by integer. Well, that is going to be 6 divided by 7 is going to give me an answer of uh, less than 1, a decimal point. But notice down here it gives me a 0. The reason it gives me a 0 is because it's rounding it to the lowest integer. But all I have to do in my formula is introduce some kind of accuracy, anything that's a little bit more accurate. For example, if I do 7.0 here and I rerun this, now, all of a sudden, I have what's called a real value here, or a double value if you were talking about in the C-sharp world. But the data type is real, which means now that it's expecting a decimal point. It's now going to return back my answer to me exact because it's going to give me decimal points. Now, watch what happens. Now the answer comes back precise. Why? Because the answer came back as a real because there was a real within the formula. Now, this may cause a little bit of a problem later. Let's continue on and let's talk a little bit more about that. Okay, So putting a 6 divided by 7 on, if all you have to do is go back in and put a point zero, not a big deal. Okay, But sometimes you're going to find out that you don't have that ability. For example, this 6 right here might have been generated from a column and it's an integer. And this 7 might have been generated from a column, and it's an integer. And there's no way that you could say, take this column divided by that column and get back a decimal value. So what we will find out as time goes on, and there are other ways to do this. But right now, as far as we're concerned, you can multiply one of the sides 
times 1.0. The moment you introduce a times 1.0, you've got that real accuracy here, and it's always going to come back and give you the correct answer. So if you can put a .0 on the end of 7, great. That's the easy way to do it. But if these numbers, you have no ability, then just one of these sides, all you have to do is introduce a times 1.0. Let's go back and take a look at an example of that one. Okay, so 6 divided by 7. If I execute it, I get the 0. But as in algebra, and I know we hate algebra, folks, but as in algebra, anything that's done in parentheses is done first. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say take that 7 and multiply it times 1.0. So the moment I do that, it's going to multiply this together. It will become 7.0, and 6 divided by 7.0 will give me back that accuracy. Again, doesn't mean a lot right now. This will mean a lot to us later, though, when we're generating formulas within a uh, SQL SELECT statement. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about column headers because you'll notice that when I ran these two select statements just a moment ago, let's look at them, I ended up with no column header. It says no column name up here. It's not a big deal if we're just looking for SQL output, but the fact is, is most of the reasons that we're developing these applications is for a programmer to use on the other end. And for the programmer to use this data on the other end, it has to be associated with some kind of column information. And right now, the column name on here is basically a null. It has no name on it. So for us to be able to use any kind of data, we have to make sure it always has a column header. And in fact, this point forward, folks, anytime you turn any information into me, it will always have to have a column header. It doesn't make sense right now, but it will in just a minute, and it's not a big deal. So let's jump back over. Um, well, in fact, let's just stay right here. Right here. So the moment that I type any kind of information in, okay, right immediately after that, I can put a space immediately after that and give it any name I want. Now, the formal way to do it in ANSI SQL, which is the standard that we're trying to do, is the keyword as, and right after it, we're going to give it the name. Now, let's start off right now by putting the name in apostrophes. Okay? So, and we'll take a look at some shortcuts here in just a second, how to do exactly the same thing. By the way, when it comes to shortcuts, as long as you know what you're doing, okay, I'm not going to ever gig you on shortcuts as long as the output comes out correctly. So you can pick whichever method I'm going to show you you want to use. I'm going to guess which one students will want to use most commonly, but nonetheless, I'm going to show you both of them. So I'm going to give this a column header called My Data right here. Okay, And I'm going to go ahead and execute it. And notice, oops, I put it, look what I made a mistake here. I put a double quote in the end of it. Let's go back and put my apostrophe back in, and let's execute it. Now, notice what happened. It came back in and gave me the answer, but the as my data at that end of that column became the column header. Now, by the way, this is a rectangle of data, right? Even though uh, 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 it's got a row and it's got a column in it, so even though it's a single row and a single piece of data, it's still a rectangle. No different than um, bringing all the data back as we did before was a rectangle. There's always going to be an equal number of cells in every row. So let's go back and take a look at this. I may have to jump ahead a little bit in some of my slides, but that's OK. Now, this, uh, these apostrophes right here are not required except under a couple of situations here. Okay? Um, I could put a space inside my data right here. And if I execute it, you'll see that there's a space that comes in my column header. Okay, let's make that Y a lowercase and re-execute it. Okay. So notice now I've got MySpace data. We as developers are not going to want to do it this way. Why is that? Because later we're going to go back and grab this data out and there's going to be a space in it. Can we include spaces in column names? Yes, we can. But from the programmer standpoint on the other end, you probably don't want to do it that way. Um, you probably want to go back in and use camel type case for your col column headers, something like that. See how we've got it back again? But these apostrophes right here are going to be optional, okay, under a couple of conditions. Watch this. If I get red, 
of those and I rerun it, it's still going to work. It's going to give me the same information. But now if I put a space in the middle of it, now I'm going to get an error. Okay, if I execute it. And the reason is, is it says, I don't know what this floating piece of data is. Later we're going to find out why that error specifically comes up. But in this case, if you have to have a space in your column header at any time, okay, then you have to put apostrophes around it. Okay, just like that. Now another thing is we know the word select, those are called reserved words, that means it's a command. There's a lot of commands like where and order by. These are commands that SQL uses. We cannot use unique those types for column names. If I try to do select here, okay, it's going to come back and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you can't use select as a column header because it's already a column command or it's already a SQL command. Because I, I don't know what that means now. But I can force select to be the column header if I want to. Probably don't want to, but I could force it to by putting apostrophes around it. Okay. Now, my me putting apostrophes around it, notice how it worked. Probably not the best choice of a column header you want, but it is possible. So if you want to override that, um, to be using a reserved word for a column header, or you want a space in it, you have to put apostrophes around it. Now, let's step back another step. Microsoft SQL, or their version of ANSI SQL, and, and as well, most versions of ANSI SQL, will also let you forgo the as portion of it, right here. So if I came back here, and let me get rid of select, that makes me nervous here. Let's call it my data. Okay, so if I run this, now, notice now that without the keyword as, it let it be in there. And in fact, if this is not a reserved word, and I execute it, I don't even have to put apostrophes around it. So there is my column header. Now, I could add in, by the way, another column if I wanted to. Let's say I want to put in just the number 7 here. Okay, and I'm going to call it your data. Now notice what's happened here. Okay, I'm s let's execute it first. Notice how I get your data here. I'm separating my columns now, multiple columns, with a comma. Commas are going to be used to separate columns out. So the data that's going to go into this is this and this. The column header will be this way and this. Now if I want to write it out the long way, the more formal way I could put as and apostrophes around it. Something like this. Okay, So that's the long way. You're going to see me go through these examples, folks, over and over and over again. So just bear with me here. Okay, Let's jump out of this and let's jump back to the slides. And I know that I got ahead of myself just a little bit. So let's go back through here. Here's some examples as far as the long method, okay, as answer. This is the formal way. And before I go on, I do want to point one problem out. Normally, uh, you're going to have access to my PowerPoint slides. If you were to copy this select statement out and you paste this back in to uh, Management Studio to try to execute it, you're going to get an error. And the reason is, is because PowerPoint in its grandiose has decided to treat these apostrophes differently. That's a different opening and closing apostrophe. So if you're going to copy these statements out, you're going to have to go back in and convert these apostrophes out. Let me give you a for instance here. Um, I'm just going to go back to this slide. You can't see it, but I'm copying it. Let's go back over now to SQL, and I'm going to paste that statement in that I just copied, the one that we just looked at. And notice what's happened here. If I execute it, it's going to give me an error at the apostrophe. So all i got to do is either remove those, or if I want to use a long method, just go back in and put my own apostrophes back in and rerun it, and voila, it works. Jump back over to those slides again. So this slide, again, just goes and shows you the column header options that you have within here, how you can choose to do it. Um, notice that I can have complete statements in here with spaces inside of it. As a developer, it's probably not likely that you're going to want to do that, but it's available. Also, ANSI SQL will allow you to use square brackets if you choose to 
in lieu of apostrophes, in lieu of apostrophes. Okay. And you can also use quotation marks in the, in the latest uh, Management Studio, but I would not recommend this. And I'll show you a little bit later why I wouldn't recommend it, but it does work, and I would not take points off it if you chose to do it that way. But I will promise you later you're going to have some issues with it. Okay. Oh, well, I guess if I'm going to show you the reason, here's the best reason right now. Later, when you're writing a program, so this would be an example perhaps of what you might see in the C-sharp world, you're going to pass a select statement into a variable as a string. Okay. Now, if I'm going to pass it in as a string in the C-sharp world, I put quotation marks around the outside of that statement. But what if I had originally put quotation marks on the inside? right instead of the apostrophes as you see here well what would have happened is it would see the opening quotation mark here the closing quotation mark here and said what the heck is all the rest of this <coughs> pardon me now there are ways that you can go back in there and you could put um, control characters in to allow it but the best way folks is simply get in the habit of using single apostrophes so that this is allowed to happen Okay, so now let's go back in. We've taken a look at the basic aspect of the select. We, we can see that the select is strictly there to put output, but this select statement does so, so much more. So let's go back in and take a look at it in its most basic format. The basic format of the select statement says select, and then you give it a list of columns from your table that you want to list, the from statement, and the name of the table that you want to get back. So you, you give it a column list, name of all the columns that you want, and then you tell it from which table. Now the most basic form of this is select star from table, as you see in the middle example here. What that says is, give me all the columns, that's referred to as a wild card, folks, give me all the columns in the order of which they exist or originally were created in the design from and the name of the table that you want to pull from. Okay? Now, Let's go back and take a look at that one, and then we'll come back and look at this slide again. So let's go back over the select statement. Um, I'm going to open up baseball and open up my tables, and these are all my tables that exist. So what I would like to get is all the data, and there's a lot of it, by the way, folks. I want all the data from players because that's basically the heart of the table. So I would type select all columns, and it's going to give me the columns in what order? Let's open up players. They're going to be in this exact order right here. Okay, All columns from, and the name of the table is players. Okay, Now, as long as I've got the right database selected, or yeah, the right database selected in this top left-hand corner, I can reach up here and tell it to parse it, and it's going to tell me, is the format in the correct uh, is correct based on the select. It doesn't guarantee me the players table exists. It just says, yep, that looks like a good select statement to me. Now I'm going to execute it. And what it did is it went out to my server, okay, at the SCC SQL Server website, grabbed all of that data, and it actually moved it back to me, and it did it behind the scenes with XML, which doesn't really matter to me, but it brought it back behind the scenes to my local computer, and right now in memory, or cached in this computer, is all of this data. And there's, there's 18,846 rows. If you look at this bottom right-hand corner, you'll see it. So it brought all the data back in this order, as you see right here. That's the most basic select statement right there. Let's continue and take a look at some other examples here. So again, the asterisk returns back all records. If I want to return back only certain columns, not all data like the asterisk gives me, but only certain columns, and maybe I even want to change the order of the columns, then I can include the columns within my list. So you see right here. So let's go back to my example again, and let's take a look at that one. So you'll notice these are all the existing columns that I can choose from. So let's say that all I want to know is the player's first name and their last name, and maybe where they were born. Okay. So in order to do that, I'm going to get rid of this asterisk, and I look at the exact column names that I've got. So I've got name first and name last over here on the left-hand side. So that's what I'm going to type in. 
name first. And notice IntelliSense comes up. The reason it comes up now is because it knows the table it's coming from. Had I not created this from table name, it wouldn't have known where to pull this data from. So it's kind of a little shortcut here. So I could go back and say, okay, I want name last. I hit a comma, okay, and then I want name first. And there's my name first from players. Okay. Now maybe I want to include, let's see here, maybe their player ID. And notice that I can put it in any order I want now. So over here I'm going to do comma player ID PK. Now PK stands for the primary key. Okay. So I'm going to check this, check it. That says the structure is okay, right? Now watch this. If I Let's get rid of the F and from and do this check. He says, ah, ah, something's wrong near players. It doesn't know exactly, but it says, boy, I got all the way over here to players and I didn't know what it meant. Now, why is that? We're going to see in a minute. It probably thought that that was a column header for player ID, which we'll see in a minute. And it says there's no from. So as soon as I correct that, okay, I check it. Everything's okay. And now watch what happens. I execute it. And I'm only getting the last name, the first name, and that player ID from players. Okay. So I could put any of these columns in any order that I want. I could grab that player ID if I wanted to and move it right over here in the middle. Oops, better get that comma move back here. Right there. Rerun it. And now I got the player ID in the middle. So any order, any data that I want to get, I could pull out. So now let's talk about the column headers. Let's put it a little bit more in perspective now than what we had before. Before we were just dealing with numbers and it did the math for us, but it doesn't pull that data out of a column per se. So now let's go back over and change some of these column headers. Okay, so I've got this player ID PK. Um, maybe I don't want to call it player ID PK. Maybe I want to just call it player ID. So the long way to do this, as I showed you a minute ago, would be as, and then I could type in, maybe I want to come out with a capital P, player, player ID, okay, and there we go. So I check this, okay, I execute it, boom, and notice now what happened is player ID. Now before I go on, I want to go back to that DNA reference model where the database and the business logic don't know what's happening. All it knows, the business logic says, I make a request for data and the data is passed back to me. Uh, so all I did is request the data. Here's the thing, folks. When a program requests data, it has no idea of the underlying database that it came from or the underlying table. All it knows is the program requested data to come back. This is the data that came back. It has no clue where this data came from. It has no clue as far, I mean, the select statement that you put into it obviously does, but the program itself just knows it just received data back. So I want you to keep in mind that it doesn't matter what the columns are. The data that comes back, as you see right here, is always going to be based on your select statement, and that's what the table knows on the other end. The table, or your business logic on the other end, has no clue that I changed player ID from player ID PK to player ID. All it knows is it received player ID, and this is its own world. This is, as far as what exists, this is the data right here that exists in that world. We feed the data to our programs. Now, let's back up up here. Let's do a little bit of playing around with this, just to try those different ways of column um, headers. So what I could do here is, is get rid of these apostrophes because player ID is not, there's no space in it. Okay, If I put a space in it, I could run this by the way and there's a space in it. But player ID is not a reserved word so I could actually technically if I want to take some shortcuts get rid of that, those apostrophes. Even though it looked like there was an error, there's not. Let's rerun it and I get the same thing. And in fact I can get rid of as here and I execute it, and there we go. Same thing. Okay. Now, um, 
One thing I want to point out is I can have multiple column headers across the board. So I've got player ID there. Oh, before I go on, how does it know that last name is a column, player ID, PK is a column, but player ID is not? It's that space here. Remember, columns are separated now by col commas. So that is one complete column right there. Okay, so I could come back here if I want to really modify this and do, maybe I could do last and probably first over here, just like that, and execute it. And now I get last, player ID, and first. And probably to make this look a little bit cleaner, let's move that column here all the way back over here after last. And let's re-execute it. That way I get last, first, and then player ID. But notice again what it's doing is it's giving me every single record back. I haven't told it only certain records. Right now I've told it I want every single record returned. Okay, let's jump back over to our lecture here and continue on. So we can combine um, a variety of different types of information. We can put column literals in here. Now notice here I've got it, select 21 is age, sign here as signature, and it's only going to return one row back because it's, these are not columns information. So basically what this slide is telling me here is that not only can I go out there and have a column that is based on um, column of a table, but I can put my own column in there if I wanted to. And an example of that might be something like, um, oh my gosh, I'm not feeling real creative here right now, but let's say I want to come over here and say um, I want this to be a sign-in. So this, the person was expected to sign in. So, and this is going to be a little form that I created. So I want to put an apostrophe here. I want a bunch of, not hyphens, but underscores to go here. And I'm going to put the word sign here. So the column header is sign here. I could have done as. I could have put apostrophes around it. But now watch what happens when I execute this guy. Let's check it. It says it's good. Notice that I got sign here with all of these different lines. That is what's referred to, folks, as a literal. As a literal. Okay? I can put, excuse me, I went a little bit far there. That is the literal. I'm just saying for this column, all I want to do for everybody is put an underscore in for a, for a signature location and I'm going to put the column header sign here in. I could put numbers in there as well. Okay? I might want to do 6 times 4 and I'm going to put the keyword, and I'll just spell this one out, as total right here. Okay, and execute it. And notice I get 6 times 4, 24 is total. So that's what this PowerPoint slide is talking about here is so that in this case I put in the value 21, the word age, sign here, and the word signature. So you might at some point want to combine things together. Now we can also have calculated or derived columns. In this particular case, I'm assuming that I have a quantity and I have a price column here. And what I want to do is I want a column that gives me the total value of that particular uh, product. If I have five items at $4 a piece, I want to know that those products are worth $20. So in this particular case, what I'm telling it, and this is where um, we're going to start talking a little bit about those formulas we used a minute ago. I'm going to take the price column times the quantity column, and I'm going to call that new column value right here, new column value. Now let's go back and take a look at this in, in, in works with our baseball table. Okay. So if I go back to baseball, you'll notice over here that I have a particular column. I'm going to get rid of this stuff up here, by the way, folks. I just want to have the person's first name and last name in there for right now. And we're going to add some more in here in just a second. So you'll notice down here that I have a height column right here, height column. So I'm going to put height in. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and execute it. Oh, i got to put a comma, comma here. I'm going to execute it. So I want to have the last name show up. I'm going to call it last. 
I want the first name column to show up. I want to call it first. And then I want to have the height column. I'm just going to default it at its default height and execute it. Now, notice that the height comes back in in inches. What I'd really like is I'd like to know how tall this person is in feet as a decimal. Now, in order to calculate turn inches into feet, I can divide height by 12. Okay. So the moment I divide height by 12, let's run this and see what happens. Notice now that inside of here, um, I'm getting just the whole integer. And I've got no column header either. So I've got a couple of issues here. The first thing is, is that height, if you go back over and look at height, height was set up as an integer. Small integer, but an integer nonetheless. So I've got integer divided by integer, which is telling me now that my entire answer has to come back as an integer no decimal places whatsoever. But it did that. It gave me back how tall they are. And there's going to be some people in here that are five feet, like Brett Abbey. And then the rest of these people are six feet or larger. But it's not going to give me the exact size of it. So in order to get the exact size, I need to introduce a decimal to this. But before I go on, i got another issue. And that is, how come I've got no column header? I've got a column in there, height, but I have no column header. Over here, if I don't put a column header in these guys. Let's back up. And I run it. At least I get the default column name as my column header here. There's no column. But notice over here I get nothing. Why? Well, it's because this is a derived column. There's a formula in here, and it doesn't know what to call it. So anytime, folks, you have a derived column or a formula that's put in here, you will always have to give it a column header. And what's interesting is you can give it any column header. I could call it if I wanted to. I could call it height one more time. Doesn't care, right? Ex execute this. There's now I get height back. Okay, I could use the shortcut because height is not a reserved word. So I could do this, and this is going to work. I get height back, but the challenge is I still get six back, and I need to have that decimal. So remember earlier I told you that when we were dealing with numbers, as long as I introduce a decimal somewhere in that formula, the answer is going to come back as a decimal. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to come back over to this formula here, this 12 right here. And I could easily just simply go 12.0. By me introducing that point zero now, the most precise part of this formula is a real data type, which is point zero has a decimal. When I run this, boom, now I get back the precise answer. See how that worked out here? Okay. So all I had to do is introduce that point zero. Now, every once in a while, though, folks, I won't be able to do that. Every once in a while, that 12 might have come back. Let's say that, and by the way, I don't only have to introduce it to one side here, over here. What I can't do is I can't go, let's say I want to introduce it to height. What I can't do to height is go back and say height times point zero. That, that makes no sense. So in order to do it this way, okay, what I'm going to tell it to do the alternate way is to take height and multiply t height times 1.0. Now, the rules of math say any number multiplied by 1 is the same number. But by me doing this, I'm converting this height, which was now um, in inches. It, let's say it was 75 inches. I'm now making it 75.0, which now when I run this, I now get back the accuracy here. Now, I will tell you that if you're doing a formula like this, it's going to obviously, obviously, it's going to be easier to not introduce it at the height side of it, but to introduce it to the number side. Okay. So if you have that ability, it's much easier just to come over here to that 12 and make it 12.0. But there will be those instances, folks, and we'll see some examples pretty soon where you don't have that opportunity at all. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue back. Hopefully that part makes sense. And of course, I'm expecting you to pause these lectures as I go along because I know I talk fast. Um, and try these out. Everything that I'm doing right now, you can do, folks. You can go back in here. You can select the baseball 2015 table. Everything that I've typed in, you have the ability to type in. The only thing you can't do is change my data. But you can pull, extract all this data out if you want to. Okay. Um, also, I should mention too 
that later when I I told you that when I put a select statement in, Visual Studio will come back and build an insert, update, and a delete statement for me if, if it can. In this particular case, if I put the statement in, it could update part number and description, but it can never update a calculated column. It wouldn't know how to do that. So calculated columns cannot be updated. They're ignored, and that will make more sense again later. Um, now, a calculated column doesn't have to be just numbers. We can use calculated columns to do text as well. In this particular example, notice what I'm doing is I'm going to combine, I've got the last name, the first name, and what I want to do is produce a column that is made up of the last name with the comma space and the first name, maybe a proper name column. Perhaps my users are wanting to create some kind of report that generates that type of output. How might I do it? Well, this slide is a perfect example of it, although this is working in a different table. Let's go back and take a look at how I might use that baseball data, the same one we've been looking at. Okay, So I've got this last name and first name. For right now, let's get rid of this height. Let's keep it simple here. And what I want to do is when I run this guy, I'd like to create a brand new column. And in this case, I want it to become Ardzima, comma, space, David. And I want to call that column my full name column. Okay, So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to say, okay, take the name last. Okay, I want to add to it, so we're going to use the plus to add. I want to add in, <coughs> pardon me, a right after the last name, immediately I want to put a comma, I want to put a space, and I'm going to put an apostrophe. So I want the last name, and then I want this information right here added after the last name. And then I want to add in the name first. Now, notice that I typed in name first in lowercase. It doesn't care, folks. None of this stuff right here matters at all. Okay. If I use, in fact, here's how it works. It's kind of strange. This is exactly how it's typed in over here, name last. If I change this, by the way, and put a lowercase l here, we'll see in a minute when it prints out, it's going to change that to a lowercase l, but it's still going to pull the correct data. Now, when I run this, this will work, but I will have no column header. Watch this. Look what it did. Artsima, comma, space, David. Down the line here, but no column header. So the same thing holds true. I'm going to have to come up in here, and depending upon what method you want, I'll use the long way here. I might want to call it my full name here and execute it. And there you go, full name. And I end up now having data that I can pull on the programming side um, with the complete name here. Um, there was something else I wanted to point out here. What was it? as far as pulling data. Remember that when this, pro this data is received by your computer program on the other end, it has no clue that there is no full name column that exists. It's just received the data uh, on the other side. Oh, I do recall what I wanted to tell you. Um, with standard ANSI SQL, there is no way of combining uh, numeric data and string data. So here I'm, I'm combining uh, a varchar or string data with string data. What it will not let me do is, and there is a way to do it, but you can't do this in standard, is something like, um, let's do this. Say I wanted to put the word height equals inside the column right here, just like this. And then after that, just like we did a minute ago with full name, what I decided I want to do is to come back in here and add in the person's height. Okay? And then I could call it maybe height. Something like that. Okay. It won't let me do that. And the reason is, is in standard ANSI SQL, I cannot combine text information with numeric information. Check it out when I try to execute it. Oh, right here. So again, look at this. The parsing said, looks like it's good to me, but it didn't check when it parsed to see that this was numeric right here. It said, well, the structure looks pretty good, 
That's okay, but when I tried to execute it, it came back and said, nah, sorry, you cannot merge a numeric column with a height column here. Now, there are ways to do it in Transact SQL, but not in ANSI SQL. Transact SQL is the extended SQL that was added with Microsoft SQL, but this class is ANSI SQL. We're trying to teach as generic as possible. Later, I'll introduce you to a little bit of Transact SQL, but for right now, I'm not going to ask you to do anything like this. Let's go ahead and continue on here. Uh, so we pretty much finished this section or section one of SQL. What I would expect you folks to do is to go back in and practice this. Don't just let me show it to you the first time. Pause the slides. The way that you're going to understand SQL the best way is just to fiddle with it. There's nothing you're going to do in my baseball data to harm my baseball data. That's why I made mine only readable. Later, I'll let you copy the data into your database, and you can do whatever you want with it. But for right now, play around with my data, investigate. You can't do an error that's going to damage my data, delete my data, change anything, wipe my SQL server out. So play. 